And finally, the reason we are all here today for our guest speaker, Kelly Okumoro, Okumoro. And it is such a pleasure for me to introduce Kelly because Kelly has been a long-term partner of our food systems major and was actually one of the first community partners that I connected with when I first started at UW. Um, Kelly is now firmly embedded in the food systems world, but prior to that had a different life as a graphic design artist, right? And so after a long time in that profession, Kelly went back to school and then started a farm, yes. And so moved into the world of farming, moved into the um, study of agriculture and food systems, and eventually began working with Farm Stand Local Food and the Farm to Table program through the city of Seattle, which is now the Farm to Preschool program. And this is an incredibly important um, program for our city, an example to many other places of connecting with local agriculture, bringing in fresh, uh, locally produced produce into the hands of very little children. And it is such an amazing opportunity. And so I'm so grateful, Kelly, that you made time for us for this seminar. And please join me in welcoming Kelly warmly up to the stage. Come on up. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much. So I how do I just I'm gonna turn that um. on? Oh yeah, okay, we're working. Sorry, this is way more technology than I am accustomed to, so I need a little technical assistance. Well, firstly, I just wanna thank everybody for being here today. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to get to speak to all of you about the work that we're doing. I just had the opportunity to meet um, Chef Bruce, who you'll hear from a little bit later. Um, and, and he was excited to learn about our program because we're a little bit closer to the ground and we're just out there doing the work. It's not a program that um, people necessarily get exposed to. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to come to events like this and talk to a broader audience. So I know that over the course of this seminar, you're gonna hear from a really big variety of speakers, some of whom are directly connected to food production through farming and other activities. And my world is really a world that's connecting all of that food production kind of out into the larger community. And we're really threading together the ideas of where food comes from, how it's produced, who has access to it, and how we can basically collaborate across different sectors in the food system to create a better version of it. One that really honors land, one that really appreciates farm and food workers, and one that is really promoting and creating better health for the community. So, let me continue. All right, so I wanted to share a little bit of the basics of how the program works. So as Yona mentioned, up until this last year, the program was called Farm to Table, and we changed it to Farm to Preschool, really kind of acknowledging that, unfortunately, there's a lot of negative stigma attached to that Farm to Table concept and who has access to it. And so we took this opportunity to change the program name and also make sure that the program was very understandable for the folks that it was designed for. So in a nutshell, we provide locally produced and culturally relevant foods and nutrition education to preschool sites, children, and families all based in Seattle. Um, the program was actually originally launched 13 years ago with a CDC grant and started with just eight pilot sites. So we have been around for a long time, but we've experienced a lot of evolution during that time. And the original idea came from a childcare cook that we still work with today at a preschool site who had reached out to the city of Seattle because she wondered if there was support in accessing and buying more local food for the meals that she was preparing um, for her preschoolers. And she is a fantastic cook, and she is pretty much like the ultimate example of how you can do this kind of farm to preschool work and integrate a huge variety of local food into what children get to experience at preschool. So over the years, the program has evolved to have kind of two big arms, one focused on early learners and one focused on seniors. The senior programming spun off and is funded separately, although a lot of the same organizations that you'll hear me talk about today are involved in both pieces of that work. And our section of the program really focused specifically on preschoolers. So this year we're working with 47 preschool sites, which means we're reaching over 1600 students, which is really exciting to be able to have that kind of reach. Um, we prioritize 
preschools that are serving families living on low incomes and BIPOC families. And we work with the City of Seattle's Department of Education and Early Learning specifically to identify those preschools because it's important to us that we're directing our services to communities that are facing the greatest disparities. So there's priority in the work that we're doing. Um, our funding comes from the City of Seattle Sweet and Beverage Tax. So I know we're all familiar with the SBT, but not everybody knows where it goes to. So now you know one piece of very tangible work that is funded by that tax. And we basically wouldn't be here without that funding. So for us, it's really important. And we are really honored to share that with a lot of other wonderful programming that's being funded by that same source. Um, we are, one thing that's unique about our program is that Farm to Preschool doesn't exist as an entity unto itself. It is a collaboration of community partners. And so we are really bringing together a pretty big group of actors from across the food system, including nonprofits, the city of Seattle, small businesses, local distributors, to really come together and collaborate on work, kind of recognizing that the food system is big. And so you need to have a big approach to kind of create the system change that we're looking at. So across our team, we come from a lot of different backgrounds. We have a lot of different perspectives. We bring a lot of different skills, and that is probably our greatest strength, is the ability to bring that kind of diversity and that kind of innovation to the work that we do. And like Yona said, lots of us do not come from food or farming backgrounds. I spent 25 years as a graphic designer before I made this changeover, but I had been reading about food, I'd been cooking food, and when I had the opportunity to make this shift, I jumped and it was by far the best thing that I have ever done. I'm very grateful that I was able to make that change. I did that a little later in life. So I definitely hope that I'm inspiration for people that you can change tack at any point along the way. So the concept of our program and the model really rests on the idea that the best way to create systemic change is through collaborative and cross-sectoral efforts through mutually reinforcing activities and by having a commitment to a shared purpose. So that's really how we approach that work. But we also recognize that collective work usually takes more time and it takes dedicated facilitation. The outcome for us, and I think the outcome in general for this approach, is better programming. It's definitely deeper trust between both the partners who do the work and participants, and it's stronger relationships that we hope will stand the test of time, relationships really being key to our ability to do any of this work and have positive impact in the preschool communities that we're supporting. So my role is really to nurture these partnership efforts. And historically, the partners in this program really worked in silos. And the pandemic was a catalyst for us to be able to continue programming in the face of all the disruptions, we really came together and it was an eye-opening experience that fundamentally changed how we do this work. The more we connected to what each other was doing and supported each other, the better programming got. The more sites were engaged and the stronger our relationships got. So we really took that learning with us and we really got connected to this idea of the power of our collective action. So systemic issues require systemic solutions. And so we really take a very broad but holistic approach in how we do this work. And one of the ways we do that is about thinking about how we can make connections between some of these really big food systems concepts. So one is the idea that the health of the land is directly connected to the health of our food. Um, one is trying to connect urban and rural communities. Farmers are a vital part of every one of our existence and community, so farmer well-being is community well-being. I think because many of us are, have a lot of distance between us and the people who produce our food or the land where food comes from, that it can feel like that is something separate from us, but the fact is that farmer health is our health. We really want to connect the school and home environments for students, recognizing those are the two places that young learners, that all learners, spend the majority of their time. So integrating those experiences and integrating families into that experience is a really important way to kind of deepen the work and the impact. And then finally, we want to recognize whole child health, that we're not just talking about physical health. It can be very easy to get lost in the nuts and bolts of nutrition and vitamins and minerals, but that social emotional health is just as important in thinking about a whole child's health and thinking about the idea of helping children have self-esteem and a sense of agency and making good choices for themselves over the course of their lives. 
So why preschool? Um, there's a lot of opportunity in this arena. I have that, Bruce and I just had a whole mini conversation about that as he's trying to kind of work his way into the K through 12 school system, which I, that was very apt to call it a fortress. <laughs> the preschool world has a lot of unique opportunities, although the childcare industry faces a lot of challenges. Um, so one is that young children are still forming their preferences around food. So you have a real opportunity in this space to help them develop preferences that are about a large range of foods and, a, and the idea of making those kinds of good food choices for themselves. So the idea being that if we're supporting the development of lifelong healthy habits, that those can improve health outcomes for children and those can reduce rates of uh, chronic rates of chronic diet related disease. But we recognize that it takes a lot of exposures. In fact, it takes eight to 10 exposures to new foods and new concepts to influence behavior change. So for our program, but also in supporting the preschool environment as a whole, it's not coming in and doing a single class. It's being able to be there repeatedly and it's being able to resource preschools to be able to incorporate this into the work they're doing on a daily basis because that's where that change happens. Um, we also recognize that there are really high rates of food insecurity in Seattle and King County, particularly in the south end of both the city and the county, and that those rates of food insecurity are even higher in households with children. And so part of some of the work we do is really trying to get food to families and try to address some of those gaps. Um, and then finally, the childcare industry. It was struggling before the pandemic and the pandemic basically ravaged the childcare industry. Um, it is already an industry with extremely low pay and really demanding work conditions. Um, most childcare workers are women and people of color. There is, are extremely high rates of turnover. In fact, I was just looking and we work in, a, of our 47 sites, we observed staff turnover at 25% of them just in the last six months. So part of maintaining those relationships and maintaining that channel of support to sites is recognizing that these are endemic challenges that this industry faces. So a big part of how we design and operate the program is about supporting childcare workers by providing activities and resources to enhance the learning environment at school, by improving the quality of food going into school meals, and by providing skill building opportunities for teachers so they can do this work on their own, whether that's enhancing work that they're already doing or introducing these as new concepts in the classroom. So the program players. Basically, of all of the organizations that are contracted with the city of Seattle to implement farm to preschool work, so that includes nonprofit organizations like TILF, it's probably one many of you are familiar with, it includes small businesses, it includes a local food distributor. So again, it's that variety of players. The city of Seattle is our funder and our facilitator, so we work directly with the Human Services Department, but you already heard me talk about the Department of Education and Early Learning, which is another key partner. And then really importantly, and why I have it in the center of that diagram, is preschool sites and staff. They really are our gateway and our connection to kids and to families. So having strong relationships with folks at preschools is absolutely paramount to our ability to do this work. And then that we're delivering those services to students and families and last, but absolutely not least, because they are key to any of this happening, is local farmers. So that the way we've designed this program is trying to create tangible benefit for both children and families and for the farming community. So now I'm gonna dive a little bit into some of the components of the work and then end with some of the impacts and outcomes we're having in the community. So uh, we have three big areas of work. The first is local food procurement. So that's provided by our partner Farm Stand Local Foods, who's a hyper-local food distributor, and you may have heard about them at some point. <laughs> um, so they offer a, a mar an online marketplace that has a huge variety of locally produced foods, including fruits and vegetables, dairy, grains, meat, value-added products. And I like to emphasize that diversity of what they offer because a lot of, I think, work towards K through 12 and the childcare community is very focused on fruit and vegetable, which is extremely important. 
But being able to offer sites high quality proteins is really important. That's an item that's very expensive and being able to get that through this program subsidized is a really important piece of the offering. So really having that range and letting sites bring in what they need is an important part of how we look at food procurement. Um, so basically we give all the preschools that we work with stipends so that they can purchase local food through Farm Stand Local Foods online marketplace. That marketplace operates year round. It supports a network of more than 70 small scale local farms across Washington state with a huge majority of them being within 50 miles of Seattle. And a unique thing about working with a food hub and an entity like FarmStand is that farmers set their own pricing and oftentimes create their own listings on the marketplace. So we, I think we're, we're really trying to flip that piece of the conventional food system that strips the majority of money away from farmers. And we're trying to flip that on its head and send the majority of money from sales directly to those farmers. Um, they are able to offer a really huge range of products throughout the season. That is a screenshot of the marketplace from yesterday. So you can see there's a big diversity there from lemongrass to the end of tomatoes, the beginning of winter squash, there's beef um, and there's Asian pears. So there's a really big range of products and the market is really a great way to essentially learn about seasonality by seeing what's available at different times of the year. So we provide the preschools that we work with total autonomy in purchasing. We don't tell them what to buy, when to buy, or how much to buy, because we really believe that they know their preschool communities the best and that they are the best suited to make those decisions. But when they place orders, we deliver them directly to those preschools. And while that might seem like a small detail, it's actually a really important one. It's addressing the fact that when you have an overworked staff with really limited resources, that asking someone to pick up food or pay for delivery can in and of itself be a barrier to getting to that food. So by bringing those deliveries directly to the sites, we are helping to make sure that local food actually reaches those preschools. So our second big area of programming is nutrition education, and it all hinges on the idea of hands-on experiential learning. Particularly for this age group, we're not talking about rote memorization, we're talking about learning with your body. So we offer cooking, nutrition, and garden classes through three different education nonprofits, Tilt Alliance, Solid Ground, and Lifelong, who also do lots of other amazing work in the food system. So when they bring those classes to sites, they bring all of the supplies and all of the equipment that you need. So we're not asking sites to resource those classes. We're bringing everything that's needed. Um, we also had the opportunity last year through the Equitable Communities Initiative. We received one-time funding from the City of Seattle to be able to work with community partners to develop a curriculum for our educators to use in their classroom work. So we were able to basically collaborate with three BIPOC-led organizations to help develop lesson plans and family newsletters with the idea that we wanted to make sure that our curriculum was representative of the preschool community in Seattle. So including community partners in that work and in that thinking process. Um, in addition to the classes, we also offer family engagement events and definitely our most popular one are pop-up farm stands where we bring a farm stand to a preschool site, usually during pickup time. It's a great way for parents to be involved in these experiences, for kids and parents to shop together at the marketplace, and it's a great way to teach and celebrate about seasonal foods. It also is an example of where we are collaborating across our partnership by bringing together a procurement partner with our education partners. So again, when we're thinking about that holistic approach, it's not just about tying big food systems concepts together, it's also about how we approach the work and that we are looking for areas of collaboration where we can deepen the impact and basically the meaning of the work that we're doing. So in addition to family classes and family events, we also bring farmers into the classroom and we offer field trip opportunities. Field trips, everybody wants to do them. They are nearly impossible to actually do. Transportation is a massive barrier, particularly in the preschool and childcare world. It's expensive, the logistics are complicated, there's a lot of risks involved. 
So even though we offer opportunities to visit places like Rainier Beach Urban Farm and Wetlands and Mara Farm, we recognize that field trips are not realistic and accessible to everybody. So bringing farmers into the classroom and finding ways like that that we can connect farmers to children and they can be introduced to farming and farming concepts is a really important way to help build those relationships and was the focus of the project I did with another one of Yona's classes where student cohorts developed farm cards that featured different farmers that are part of our network. And again, it was specifically trying to create tools that we can, our educators can use and we can leave in the classroom again to help foster those relationships when we know that it is not necessarily realistic to take four-year-olds to a production farm. Um, so finally, like I had mentioned earlier, it's really important that we're looking kind of at the whole picture of the preschool. So that also means that we're empowering teachers and preschool staff to be able to do this work on their own. So just last week, we hosted a staff training that was focused on enriching the preschool classroom. It came with a resource kit that included things like books, teaching guides, cooking equipment, play area toys. Um, and then the workshop really focuses on kind of skill building. Again, whether it is a preschool that may be doing work like this already, their ability to enhance and deepen that work, or whether it's preschool that may be new to doing work like this and introducing kind of the basics and the toolkit to be able to do that work. Um, and then finally, we offer a lot of our resources online. And over the last few years, we've finally been able to direct funding for translation and we're really recognizing we did some community engagement work and it was an important part of the findings from that that to make our program accessible it needs to be available in multiple languages we're working on bringing that into the active nutrition ed part but at least through our resources we've been adding translation in multiple languages the preschool community in Seattle is incredibly diverse. There's more than eight languages spoken, so it's a pretty big endeavor, but we're working on expanding kind of that, that range of what we have to offer every year. So finally, the last big piece is family food bags. So up until this year, this was run as a completely separate program, also funded by the city of Seattle. It had a very strange name called Fresh Bucks To Go. Um, it is implemented by four different organizations, one connected to Farmstead Local Foods called Pacific Coast Harvest. Um, also, Tilt Alliance does this work as well. In fact, they pretty much piloted this idea based on, I've learned long, only recently, a Canadian program. Yeah, a good, that was called the Good Food Bags. It essentially is creating bags of fresh produce to go out into the community. Um, also, Pike Place Market and Family Works all do this work. So what we learned in our community engagement work is that there was confusion on the side of participants, meaning preschool sites and families, about what belonged to what program, because from their point of view, all these pieces of programming felt really connected, and they were right. They are totally connected to each other. So over the last year, we worked with the city to bring this piece of the programming under the umbrella of Farm to Preschool and really try to make a more cohesive experience for the participants. Instead of spending our efforts trying to tell people, no, this is this and no, this is that, it's let's bring it all together because they are deeply connected to each other. The more we integrate them, the more powerful the experience, so they should live together under one program roof. So in a nutshell, the family food bag providers provide bi-weekly bags of fresh produce to families through their preschools. Um, the bags always come with an insert that includes information about the produce, the farmers, storage tips, recipes. So we're really trying for not, to not just drop the bag at the front door, but provide some of the wraparound resources to make the bag more usable. Um, we, the food bag providers really prioritize sourcing from Washington producers and they specifically direct sales to BIPOC immigrant refugee and women farmers. So we're really putting our money where our mouth is in terms of not just saying that we're supporting a diverse farming community, but we are very purposefully and strategically directing sales to different parts of the farming community that have been historically excluded from the food system. Um, our new partner this year, Family Works, is able to provide a, their mobile food pantry to the sites that they're partnered with, which is a really exciting addition because typically the bags come pre-packed and families just take them home. But in this case, through the mobile food pantry, they're able to set up effectively what is a pop-up market and families get to have a market style shopping experience. So that's a really nice addition. We're really excited to get more feedback on how that's gone this year and definitely hope that that's something that we're able to expand over the next couple of years. 
So in total, the, these four organizations deliver more than 30,000 bags to the, our, our group of partner preschools every year. So it's pretty incredible work. So using that as the segue into what are some of the outcomes. Um, so first and foremost is increasing access to fresh nutrient dense foods and the idea that hopefully we are increasing consumption of fruit and vegetable. We're actually working with a community evaluator this year to get better at how we are measuring and demonstrating that because that's an important piece of evidence that we want to have to show that the program is having positive impact. It's also a really important piece of information to have if you're applying for funding. Um, and to be able to continue this work, we hope in the future to be able to expand the amount of funding coming in to support this work. Uh, we're also providing opportunities for young children to try new and unfamiliar foods and to learn about different food cultures. Those two priorities, access and opportunities to try new foods, were by far the highest priorities that came from the community engage work, engagement work that we did. When we talked to preschool staff and we talked to families, these were the most important things to them in terms of what would make this program successful. Um, we also are able to offer culturally reflective foods because we're supporting the diversity of the network of producers. And we're helping children understand where their food comes from and who grows it. Um, we're really promoting the idea that food is not just a commodity, but it's a connection to people and to place. And the earlier that you have that sensibility, the, the greater you can bring that into the world and how you make choices. And I think in the case of this and all of us, how we're directing our dollars. Um, we also are reducing food waste through food education, particularly by helping young learners understand the idea that they play a role in the food system and then that they can create positive change by, things, by doing things like composting. So even taking our youngest learners and helping them understand the idea of the food system, even geared down to that age level, and that they are a very active part of how the food system works. And finally, supporting school readiness. Basically, that well-nourished children are stronger learners. So again, improving the quality of food and school meals and supporting preschools and kind of broadening and improving what school meals look like is a way that we can support all learners and families. And then finally, outcomes for farmers. Kind of the biggest, most tangible one is that each year through this work, we're generating more than $350,000 in sales that's supporting over 100 Washington farms. So that's really significant. That's strengthening the food system. That's helping to demonstrate that small scale farming should and is a viable opportunity for people. Um, we're really helping to develop sales channels, again, for farming communities that have been historically excluded from the food system, carving out space so that they are an active part of what's happening in the food system and that they are welcome. Uh, we are really trying to champion farms that are using farm practices that protect soil health, that preserve biodiversity, and that are really working to mitigate climate change. Um, and that's why the focus of all of our sourcing, whether it's procurement or the family food bags, is really focused on sustainable and regenerative farms. We're trying to reduce food miles um, and the carbon footprint of food production, and local food is the way to do that. And supporting a local food system is how we can make that work resilient. And I think we all experienced during the pandemic, and there's never been more talk about it since then, about how much local food systems were so much stronger and so much more resilient than our conventional food system. So by putting our efforts in this direction, we're really creating a more sustainable future for all of us. And finally, um, we are also building, um, bridging gaps in the local supply chain. That's, I think, something that had never really been discussed in the mainstream before, but it's a really important part of how food systems work. It's kind of the nuts and bolts, and it's extremely logistical and detail focused. But for far small scale farmers, you're wearing like 25 hats. You have about the biggest work list of anybody. The idea that we, by partnering with an entity like Farm Stand Local Foods, we can provide aggregation and distribution support that helps relieve some of that task burden on farmers so that they can concentrate on farming and that our partners can offer the services that help bring that food from farms into preschools and communities. And then finally, 
that ultimately for all of this work for us as partners doing it, for the preschool sites that we work with, and definitely for children and families and farmers that we want to build those connections with each other. For farmers, it's helping them know that they are directing food into communities that need and appreciate that food. Um, and for, again, for students and families that they are connected to where their food comes from and the communities that make that possible. So. I just wanted to end with this, which is a bunch of the farmers and some of the students and classes that we work with. And I think, you know, very much like this seminar is focused on biodiverse food systems, any kind of ecosystem, that diversity is key, that's strength and resilience, and that's most definitely the case with our program work too. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was a ton of beautifully presented information, gorgeous slides, of course. Um, and now we have some time for questions, conversations. So uh, the floor is open, and I'll just ask Kelly if you could repeat questions back into the microphone to pick it up on the recording. But any questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question just had to do with the culturally relevant part. If you could just talk a little bit more about that, like. You know, what does that mean? Who decides it's culturally relevant? I know you kind of talked a little bit about it, but if you could expand that. I thank you for asking that question because that's actually like I was hoping somebody would ask this very question. It's it's an important aspect of this work, and it's a very sort of challenging and big question that we wrestle with, that we discuss a lot. It's something we come back to over and over and over. The preschool community in Seattle is extremely multicultural. So what does culturally reflective food mean in a multicultural setting? So I think from the procurement side, being able to offer a marketplace that is supplied by such a diverse network of producers and then providing sites with that autonomy and purchasing is allowing them to make the food choices that are the most reflective and appropriate for their sites. That is definitely more challenging in the family food bags when we're talking about delivering them at the scale that we are, that that is we're not able to be, we're, right now we do not have the funding or the resources to be that culturally specific in what bags go to what sites. That's also not necessarily even going to be the most effective if you have a site that have children from many, many different backgrounds. So we are working on how can we do this better? What, and what does that mean? We're actually right now trying to bring in um, a speaker to talk with our team to lead a facilitated conversation on what does culturally reflective foods mean in a multicultural setting? I think where we are now and I think where we want to see growth is the idea that cultural specificity may not be all that attainable for us based on what the program looks like. But again, introducing lots of food cultures and lots of opportunity to try different foods, whether that's going in the food bags or going into the classroom and really celebrating the beauty of different food cultures is how we can embrace that cultural relevance in the programming. So hopefully, yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's, um, it is not a guarantee that if you're working with a local producer that you're working with a, an ethical producer. In this case, that is specifically who we are working with. Farmstead Local Foods, that is absolutely what their business model is hinged on, that they're working with sustainable farmers, farmers that are not just treating the land well, but their farm crews well, where the idea is that the whole farm system is beneficial for the planet and for the people involved in doing it. Um, when you're working at a smaller scale, even though this is very difficult farming at this scale, you can do that. You can prioritize your crew, you can prioritize the farmers. We're not talking about the many levels, I think, of separation when we're thinking about huge scale farming, like in the Midwest, where a farm owner may have very little connection to the land and to the farm crew, that we're talking about a scale here where farmers are out in the field doing the work. There's almost no cases where farmers aren't directly involved in production and farm crews are small. So we can make that a priority in who we work with and we can, we have the time to learn about the farms that we're partnered with to make sure that that's happening. If you're not guiding preschools on like what to like make or buy with their stipends, like how can you be sure that they're, the kids are going to be eating healthy food every day? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, that's another one that's like a, a, a question I think that we have to wrestle with, but where our team landed is that 
if we make the food prescriptive, it's very possible that sometimes it will land in situations where it is a, not a good match, where it is not an appropriate fit and it is not necessarily welcome. So we are also like, I think most of us that have been doing this work have been doing it in various capacities for several years. And when you meet people at preschool sites, they want the best for the students and families at their sites. There is no question about that. Even if every single thing that's happening at those sites isn't dialed in perfectly, they want good and health for their students. And so we really trust, and I think we need to trust, that they want to make good choices and that they really want to promote that their students can do that for themselves. Yeah, thank you. And you and I just realized I'm not repeating any of the questions back. <laughs> All right, this was a question about community engagement work. Um, yeah, that was three, it was now three years ago. It was right before the pandemic. It was the first time in the history of this program that the city had dedicated money specifically for community engagement. I think over the course of how we all implement programming, we're doing informal kind of engagement and gathering feedback, but to actually have dedicated funding, we were able to do a lot of work um, with the UW. Actually, they were a big player in that community engagement work. We also hired an independent consultant, and that let us basically have kind of the resources and the expansive reach that we needed to do that work. So it was, focused on, on sort of food systems actors like the city of Seattle, varying departments, the sweetened beverage tax community advisory board, basically like people who exist in the sphere that helps set policy and determine where funding goes. And then we also talked with parents and families and also talked with preschool staff. And basically we brought fairly broad questions to them about what does success mean for programming like this? Um, what would you like to see in programming? Um, and, and kind of what do you think, where are we doing that? Where are we missing that? And where are there opportunities? Um, and so basically, we did three different projects in the community. We took all those findings and we kind of synthesized them together. Um, different of the entities that we worked with sort of had slightly different focus areas, but that gave us kind of a nice diversity of responses. And then out of that, yeah, you heard me talk about some of the things like prioritizing increased access and those opportunities to try new foods. Like that really helped us identify and prioritize some of the things that really fundamentally guide our work, like relationships, you've heard me talk a lot about that. That was a key finding from that work was that we recognize that from the side of sites, but we heard that reflected back to us from preschool teachers and staff, that when they could trust us, when the program was reliable and was easy to understand, that they could be more invested also in doing that work. Yeah, let's see. I mean, funding is probably the number one. Everybody's number one. Um, we recognize that lots of other great works funded by the SBT, so we are very mindful of going to the city and demanding more, not that we have any leverage in doing that. Um, we would love to expand the capacity of our team. Like right now, between all three of those organizations doing nutrition ed work, they are in total, I think, less than two full-time people for 47 preschools. So you can imagine what that looks like. And you can imagine what we might accomplish if we had four times that education team. On the regulatory side, um, it's, that's not as big a barrier for us. In fact, I totally forgot to talk about that, that one of the really unique opportunities in this preschool and childcare world is that there are in some ways a lot less rigidity. Food in the K through 12 public school system is very complicated. It's very procedural driven. There's a lot of regulations. There's a lot more freedom in the childcare and preschool world, basically trusting that sites know their communities best and can make those decisions. So I think the regulation that we're talking about is really focused more on making sure that small farms are adhering to the kinds of health practices that allow them to bring that food safely into the preschool environment. But on the preschool side, 
They have a lot of regulations, of course, that have to do with protecting the health and well-being of children, but there is actually a lot of flexibility to maneuver in doing this type of work. Oh, and we had we had one other. Should... Yes, thank you. Um, yes, the stigma around farm to table. I think when this program was first launched, that was a relatively new concept. The idea of bringing food directly to whomever it was on the receiving end. In this case, schools, seniors, and young learners. I think over the last decade or so, farm to table has, for many people, come to mean fancy food. And fancy food is expensive food, and expensive food is food a lot of us do not have access to. So part of changing that program name was moving away from that stereotype, and also a name that is exactly descriptive of what it is for the people who participate in the program. So that if a parent learns about this program and it's called Farm to Preschool, they have a pretty good idea of what we do. All right, you wanna? Yes, thanks. I was wondering if you could speak to the um, range of cooking facilities that preschools have, but also cooking tools that I saw some of the kids, like in pictures that kids are using kitchenware and, and cooking tools. And so how does that get funded? How is it, uh, how does it look across the city? Yeah, so uh, you're going to be the only question. <laughs> the question is, what do the range of kitchens and kind of cooking facilities look like in this preschool environment? It is everything you can imagine from what your apartment looks like to a full commercial kitchen. So you have some sites that are working out of a single home refrigerator and a tiny piece of counter space, maybe this much or less. You also have other preschools that happen to be at sites where there may be much more robust kitchen facilities. Some of the preschools we work with are located at things like community centers or schools where there are actually commercial kitchens. What that means is we need to gear our programming to that whole range. So again, when I mentioned our mobile classes, our educators bring everything, it is in recognition that not having a stove or not having cooking tools should not be the reason that kids aren't don't have opportunity to experience these kinds of cooking and nutrition lessons or just be able to experiment and play and learn about food so we bring that we include those in things like kits we introduce the idea that preschoolers have a lot of skills now there's a pretty big difference between three and five as i'm learning from my education team but we introduce things like safety knives crinkle cutters basically we bring in a variety of tools that are appropriate to that age group and can be applied specifically to kind of different developmental stages and really introducing the idea that if kids get interested in food at this age hopefully they'll keep that interest and that will become really a guiding idea in how they approach food as they grow older and move through life. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I'm going to um, cut the questions there. I think we had some really wonderful questions. That's wonderful. And we're going to get to hear uh, even more questions from students when you hand in your reflections after this seminar. Um, Kelly, thank you so much. I mean, I feel like this program is such an amazing microcosm of the whole food system, as you just described. And so even just at the end, talking about the skilling that's happening, right, in terms of recognizing the foods, learning skills and how to work with actually diverse produce and meat and dairy and other proteins. It's just, it's a, it's a totally different paradigm for the way that these kids might enter the world post preschool. So huge appreciation for your work, huge appreciation for this presentation, and we'll get to pick up on some of these themes like farm to table when we actually hear from Chef Ruth Naftali in a few weeks, and we'll have the chance to grapple with these concepts, dig in a little bit deeper, and see how they play out, how they have played out over time and continue to evolve. So huge appreciation for Kelly today. Thank you so, so Thank you. much. And Hope you all have a safe and peaceful weekend ahead. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. That was fantastic.